I wanted to know sort of what your takeaways were from the study and then how that then will guide future lockdowns. Okay, well, thanks for inviting me onto the program. It's good to talk about this. Um, there's a few key findings from the study that we think will inform policy, hopefully. The most striking is the one you started with, really, which is the difference both between areas, like you said, London was higher than other parts of the country, but also between different social groups. And very striking is the fact that we found that in people of black ethnicity, people of Asian ethnicity, there was a much higher rate of infection. So in black people, it was 17% compared with 5% in white. And in Asian, which is mainly um, in many South Asian populations in England, um, it was 12%. So those differences are really quite striking. The second big difference we found was that a really much larger risk of infection in people who worked in people-facing jobs in the care homes, the residential care, and in health services. Again, about 17% of people who work in care homes. So these people have really borne the brunt of this epidemic, which peaked in sort of March and April this year. What is the overlap between those two groups, Helen? Very good question. Well, ours is one of the first studies that can really look at that because we've got such large numbers. So there is an overlap and it's been thought that that's partly responsible. And that's what we've found that in fact, if uh, people of black ethnicity, um, their overall risk is about three times that of white ethnicity. But once you control for where they work, for their age, for where they live and for levels of deprivation, then it reduces to about twofold. So there's still an increased risk that we're looking to explain. But yes, there is an overlap between those two. Uh, how pervasive uh, what was the testing? Like, how did people sign up for this? And sort of how broad based is it? We wanted to find out what the prevalence was in the population. So we didn't want to ask for volunteers because we know that would get a biased sample, as you probably know, lots of people want to know if they've had this or not. So what we did was we took a random sample of the population and we mailed out letters to them. Um, and then they signed up on, um, uh, they registered either by phone or on an internet um, server. And we then posted out tests to them. And we got a really high response rate. We're pleased with that. And so it really is as near as possible to um, a representative sample of the population that we could have. Does it matter that the tests aren't that accurate and are antibodies the best indicator of somebody having had the virus? Antibodies are the only indicator that we can use at scale to see whether or not someone's had the virus. You can test the virus itself, but that's pretty short-lived. So this is actually giving us a picture of what's happened over the last several months. That's a cumulative picture of what's happened. You said the tests are not very good. Actually, we did quite a lot of development work on this, and the tests are not 100%, but no test is 100% accurate. Even tests that your doctor will do to see if you've got something is not 100% accurate. But what we know is how much um, error there is in those tests. And when we're doing a population survey, we can adjust for that error. So we know that it will miss uh, some cases, so we'll get some false negatives. But we will also get a few false positives, but we know exactly how many we will get because we tested this extensively. We so also tested it on people doing it at home, and people were quite happy to do it at home. But we are clear, it's not a test for an individual to say, I've definitely had it, or I've definitely not had it. It's a test so we can look across the population to see how roughly how common it is in this population versus that population. As we head into the fall where things get colder, harder to be outside and schools are opening, what's the next uh, broad-based test that you guys are looking to do? Well, we're going to carry on um, with a few more rounds of this. We've got one going on at the moment. So this one that I'm just talking about was done um, at the end of June, beginning of July. Um, we've got another um, 100,000 people being tested now. And then we're going out to slightly larger numbers sometime in September and we'll do another round later on. And that way we can track what is happening over time so we can see whether or not there is, now that lockdown has eased, whether or not we're going to see an increase in the summer and again when schools and universities open. So we'll be looking at those. We also know that some people, not everybody mounts an antibody response, but most people do, so we'll be missing some. But we also know that there's signs that the antibodies start to wane and reduce after time. And we'll be able to get some idea of how common that is by going back to some of these people that test positive and see if they stay positive.